Hi, I'm Pete Duncanson, Media Arts Pastor, and I'd like to take a moment to say thank you for being here. If you are physically here with us today, please be aware that for your safety, we are practicing social distancing and ask you to respect those that are using precautions as well. If you'd like to know more about what is going on right here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways. By using the physical boxes located in the back by the sound booth, through online giving, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. Second Corinthians chapter 13. Hallelujah. And look at verse 11. Second Corinthians 13 and 11 from the New Living Translation. Dear brothers and sisters, I close my letter with these last words. Be joyful. Grow to maturity. Encourage each other. Live in harmony and peace then the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet each other with Christian love. The King James, I, say, I believe, says, greet one another with a holy kiss. All of God's people here send you their greetings. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. I love that phrase in verse 11. Encourage each other. Encourage each other. We've been in a season where that, for us here at Central, I don't know that it's ever been more necessary, more critical, more helpful than it is right now. Encourage each other. Man, we, we live in a discouraging time, don't we? Uh, just walking around thinking we're not even done with this virus and we got all these bugs falling on top of us. And I know it's just bugs, but it's like, that's it, Lord, I'm ready. Take me home. You know, you just think, what next? Is the earth going to open up? Is there going to be lice, frogs, what? Encourage one another. I want to do that today. I want us to do our very best to encourage each other. I appreciate so much Pastor Martin praying for me because that's just what it felt like, just a prayer directly to God that says, hey, touch Doug today and encourage him because it can only come from the Lord, right? I mean, true encouragement. No matter what this world encourages you with, it goes away really quick. Notice here at the end of the text, the end of this letter, that Paul mentions the, the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. He actually puts that first. And then the, the presence and the work of the Holy Spirit. He puts those three on an equal, equal level. So if you have any questions about the nature of God, the expression of God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, we may not fully be able to comprehend it, but it's given to us right there, isn't it? But I want to focus in today on that phrase, encourage each other. Now go in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. We're going to look at a couple of things in, in these two letters to the church at Corinth. It's the same church, two different letters. So I think you and I would agree that this message could be considered one. And it certainly, as part of the New Testament, is one to us. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1. Now regard, regarding the questions you ask in your letter, yes, it is good to abstain from sexual relations. But because there is so much sexual immorality, each man should have his own husband. Hmm? Are you listening? Each man should have his own wife and each woman should have her own husband. Now we're going to stop right there. If you study this in any depth, and it's a chapter that takes study, 1 Corinthians chapter 7, the Holy Spirit is giving you and I a real outline of physical relationships within the church, within marriage. And I want to talk about just one aspect today. And I want you to notice this phrase, because 
there is so much sexual immorality. So we're going to focus kind of on, on that, that thought in the letter here, the two letters, so much. And this is one of the things. This is a negative, and so we're going to focus on this first this morning and deal with it. Part of what is just grieving me to the point where I don't even have words. I've referenced it many times, but I'm going to do it again today. Number one today, there is so much sexual immorality. I don't know what psychiatrists and psychologists think. I don't know what those who comment on our condition think. But I believe, this is my opinion. It's not my opinion as pastor or preacher. It's just my opinion as, as an observer. It's my opinion as an American. It's my opinion as the person who's talking. All of our problems in America right now have at their root sexual misconduct. All of them. I don't care what's going on in other nations, and there are problems. I don't care what's happening medically around the globe, and it, there is a pandemic. I don't care about the financial things, the malware, people who are hacking into different companies and shutting things down for bribes or kickbacks or what. I don't care about any of that. What I care about is how much damage is done when kids are sexually traumatized. And it has created a generation, two or three generations of people who are traumatized and in some ways paralyzed emotionally and relationally. This week, uh, in our newspaper, and I think it was a a Reuters story. The picture I'm going to show you is from the Wall Street Journal. Michigan coach, this is the University of Michigan football coach, Bo Schembechler's son. He's 62 now. Says he told his father the team doctor had abused him. Many of you, especially you guys, will remember, and this is just a screen grab from it, so you can, you can research it. But again, I told you there are other, other resources out there. Now, I had to go back because I thought, well, we've already heard about all this. But what we'd heard about over the last couple of years was the other university that made headlines, and that was Michigan State University. And the team doctor there, another doctor, who then went on to be the Olympic doctor for many Olympic athletes. And he was charged with, I forget how many, I think 200 counts of, uh, of child abuse. And this guy, now that was a couple of years ago, and still being litigated and all that. This guy, uh, who's passed away, they think that his cases number over six or 800 victims. And so I made a list. This is just from my recollection. I made a list of the people or groups who have been in the headlines in the last five years or so. The Catholic Church, thousands of victims. Hollywood. I'm throwing that in there, even though we, we as believers, as people who love Jesus, we knew that Hollywood was corrupt. And every time I read that some young woman or young man went to Hollywood, was abused, molested, raped, whatever, and they are just stunned, I think, I, I don't understand how you can be stunned. We, we knew all of that was going on there, but I'm putting it in my list anyways. The Boy Scouts. The Southern Baptist Church, the Amish. You know the other day that Sister Beth Moore left the Southern Baptist Church, left the Southern Baptist Convention because she felt their reluctance to address the abuse. Most, most people, in, in what I've read, most victims struggle as much with the, the lack of support to go after the perpetrators as they do with what happened to them. And that's just anecdotal. I'm just throwing it out there. But Sister Beth Moore wrote a letter, a pretty rough letter to the Southern Baptist when she left earlier this year. And then another guy who was on the committee resigned and left, and he wrote a letter. It was not supposed to be made public. Somehow it did, and it is sending shockwaves. The Southern Baptist annual convention begins today. The Amish, if you haven't read about the stories of the abuse inside the Amish community, it's, it's staggering. There's an, 
several articles this week. I was so caught up on this one Thursday when I read it. I, I just, this guy's 62 years old. Coach Bo Schembechler's son, 62 years old, told his dad as a high school boy, had, had to go to this doctor for physicals and whatnot, and told his dad what was going on. And his dad basically told him to shut up and toughen up. And I, I was just so distraught by that. And then yesterday and today, there are articles just flooding out from, and I have access to news. I pay for news, so I have access to a lot of things that you may not uh, get quite as easily. But you can look at this one. I'm not going to take time to, to show it to you. But in the Kansas City Star, I believe, is the newspaper. And it just came out yesterday or this morning. And it's about some group homes, Christian group homes. One of them is known as Agape Youth Home. And I, well, I, I don't know if I can even get there right now. I can't. But <clears throat> I saved the article. And these young guys are in their 20s now. Some of them committed suicide. Some of them ran away from it. two different group homes. One earlier this year, they began to bring out all of the darkness there and the other one just in the last couple of days. And I, I just want to give up. Because I can't believe that in the midst of all the things that we've argued about in the last 20 or 30 years in politics, all the things that seem so big and so important and all of this stuff in Washington, D.C., and we just act like there's no big deal about this. If you're a young person, if you, when you were a young person, if you were under the age of 18, 22, 25, and you were exposed to pornography, especially as a kid, I'm telling you, it it put trauma in your life. And years later, what the devil does is he convinces you that that's, that's just part of your life. That's who you are. You forget all about that. But things happen to you. you. Your wiring was changed in such a way that you now struggle. You're not the person God intended you to be. You don't make the decisions you were intended to make. You don't have the health emotionally that you were intended to have. All of that. You can say, well, nobody ever abused me. I'm telling you. Porn itself abuses those who partake when they're children. It leaves trauma. And this idea that all of this is just fine, it's part of the human experience, it's part of hell's experience. It's not part of heaven's experience. And it just leaves us shocked and stunned. And we can go on with life. Yeah, it's not like, you know, somebody drained all of our blood out and that was it, we were dead. But the enemy began to drain our soul, the life of our soul. And we struggle. And now here we are as a nation and nobody can hold anybody accountable because everybody's in this mess. And it's just created for us as a nation problems upon problems. I'm telling you, there are untold thousands and thousands who are in drug addiction because of the pain that was caused them. There are untold thousands upon thousands who are living in all kinds of, of lifestyles that they believe everybody should just be okay with because those kinds of traumatic experiences happen to them and they don't know what to do about it. And as a country, we are sideways emotionally. And there are other nations that know it. They are watching us. They know how vulnerable we are. And they are about to pounce. What's the answer? What can we do? Paul says, now regarding the questions you ask in your letter, yes, it's good. <laughs> he, and, and most people think the translation there is that it's good to be single, unmarried. And uh, the assumption being that because of the day and time in which they lived, maybe because of the day and time in which we live, but for all of the people who have tried that, you know, that's part of the, the mandate or the theology of the Catholic Church. You're, you were sexually celibate. There's no relationship. And yet what we found out was they, they were professing that but not living that. And it just creates all kinds of incredible difficulty and brokenness. But because there is so much sexual immorality, listen, we're not the first ones to live in the middle of this stuff. And so the Holy Spirit says, here's what you do. You, you, you have to have 
all of these certain realities. You have to change the laws. You have to change this and that. And no, the Holy Spirit says, listen, I'm going to tell you what to do. Well, pastor, for those who don't really want to marry somebody of the opposite gender, they should not have to because they don't feel that. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. There are times that every single person, every married person, every person doesn't feel like they want to be around anybody. They just, there are times when every human being wants to be around lots of other people. That's life. That's just life. But what he's saying here is that in the context of marriage, you work through things. You can together work through your past. You can together create a new future. But pastor, if they, if they bring all of this baggage with them, then together you learn how to unpack the baggage and put it away in the blood of Jesus Christ and go beyond it and get some restoration and some hope. But instead, what we have done in America is given everybody the permission to try 80,000 million different options of how to deal with it. And those options just go from bad to worse. Here's the good news. <laughs> the coming kingdom of the Lord Jesus Christ is your opportunity and mine to live the life that was always intended for us. It's a thousand years of Jesus Christ ruling and reigning and all of us ruling with him. And you can say, well, Pastor, that seems far-fetched. It seems mythical. It seems like a fairy tale. Listen, you can call it what you want, but I'm ready for it. It's a thousand years of government of the Lord Jesus Christ. There will be no abuse. Anybody that attempts to abuse somebody, and I'm talking about those who have come through the tribulation, they've come through God's judgment, and they did not get saved they did not whatever they just lived through it and now they've come into this kingdom and Jesus Christ and his glorified saints are here they try one thing bam that's it you're dealt with and you're out of the picture because God is not going to tolerate anything that harms in all of his holy mountain that's the promise of his word nothing will harm or offend in all of my holy mountain and his holy mountain will be the entire earth glory to God and in that experience you and I are going to get to live the life that was always intended for us the life that is free from having been broken or bruised having been offended or assaulted all of that will be gone glory to God now listen I, I know you're quiet <clears throat> And I know you hear me talk about this a lot, but our kids can never hear me talk about it too much. And if you're a young person here or you're watching me and you've been abused, assaulted, you've been introduced to pornography, you've been, you're being groomed is what they call it. Somebody's giving you gifts and telling you all the things that they think you want to hear reach out to me. Find somebody. One of the saddest things in the article in the Kansas City newspaper is that one of the young guys they interviewed, and I don't remember, a couple of them, they kept their names silent because they've not yet, nobody has been, uh, the investigation is still going on, nobody's been arrested. But the one young guy quotes one of the authorities, I believe a state trooper, I could be wrong, as saying, listen, I want your complete story but don't expect anything to happen because of it. That's the world. They're just, the world doesn't have answers. But I'm telling you, Jesus Christ does. And when his blood is applied and he begins to bring us out of this stuff and take us beyond it, he gives us hope. Some of those things have changed the wiring of your brain. They've changed the way that we process information, the way we live emotionally. But the blood of Jesus begins to bring healing and restoration. And it points to a day when there's a new life. It points to a day when the former things are passed away. All things become new. And everything. Everything that God intended for you will be that opportunity for you to live it, you to enjoy it, and you to be prosperous because of it. Hallelujah. That day is coming. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Our kids need to hear it. But I also am the pastor in this church, so I know how many 
I, I don't know them all, but I know that there are stories sitting here, many stories. And all I can say to you is hang on to the horns of the altar. Hang on to the blood of Jesus Christ. Hang on to the promises of God. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm just troubled because other countries, you just heard Brother Kyle talking. That no, Nobody knew. Pam didn't know what I was going to be preaching on today. Kyle didn't know it. Nobody. But you heard them talk about the realities of other countries. Part of the reason the people from the developing world and, and even First Nations, the reason that they have seen America as a light that they were trying to reach out and get to is because they believed once they got here, their abusers would not be able to touch them again. And part of what's happening in these last days, part of the garbage in our government, in our country, and I know we can say, well, well oh, th this one was going to make a difference and that one was trying to make it and this one was going to, listen, all, all we heard about, all we continue to hear about is all of the garbage and baggage that's with all of them. We need a revival from the pew up. We don't need a revival in Washington, D.C. We need a revival in the house of God, in the streets and alleys of our cities. We need a revival in our neighborhoods, on our farms. We need a revival that reaches into the Boy Scouts and the Girl Scouts. We need a revival that causes us to repent and say to God, Woe is me! I am unclean and undone. 1 Corinthians 15, verse 1. Let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news I preached to you before. You welcomed it then and you still stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you, unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. And you and I know I've read this many times that that is not the case. It is true. I passed on to you what was most important, you, uh, if you're marking in your Bible, you can mark that phrase. I passed on to you what was most important. Facebook. Twitter. The stock market. Bitcoin. The lottery. I passed on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. Christ died for our sins just as the scripture said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter, then by the twelve. After that he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Glory to God. Paul says, last of all, he was seen by me. Number two today, there is only one important thing. No matter how hurt you've been or how traumatized, no matter how your experiences have been and how disappointed you've been, there's only one important thing. You say, well, Pastor, what's happened to me has kept me from being all that I could be. You just said it. It's kept me from reaching my goals, really realizing my dreams. It's kept me. I read all the books and I watch all the people that tell me that I can have everything. But every time I get started, I just feel like there's a chain that pulls me back because of my hurt and my anger and my resentment and no matter what I do, listen, I understand how real all of that is, but the only important thing is the shed blood of Jesus Christ, that he died on the cross, they buried him in the tomb, but on the third day, God raised him from the dead. He has ascended to the right hand of the Father, and he's waiting one thing, the call of Almighty God to go and get his church. Hallelujah. And when he does, life for us will begin. We're on a kind of a timeout right now. Yeah, we're, we're not in a corner. We're just on a timeout. We're being social distanced for the rest of the time until Jesus comes. When you get saved, you're social distanced. He, he tells you, stay six feet away from the world. No, 10, maybe even 30. Put a mask on. Put a big one on, a big mask. Because that world looks pretty attractive. That world sounds really inviting. That world looks like it's going to be here forever.
The Bible again and again, I read James last night, the Bible again and again refers to how quickly this life passes. Well, it doesn't feel like it, does it? But it does go by. And the Bible equates us with just like grass out in the yard. And, and everything's fine until the sun comes up and bam, the grass or the flowers sometimes. James compares the wealthy and the brevity of their life, how, how good they feel about everything they've got. But he says in just a moment, that flower, that beautiful little flower just falls over and it's gone. The wind comes and blows it away after the sun has shriveled it to nothingness. You and I need to remember that this life is very temporal. It is passing away. It is not forever. There's only one important thing. Now, I think this is interesting. The whole second part of, of what I read you know, it, it would be one thing if Paul said he was raised from the dead. The Bible says God raised him from the dead in one place. Another place it says he picked up his own life. Again, there's an equality there between father and son. But he doesn't stop there. And we know in Hebrews that he's alive in heaven, making prayerful intercession for us. Glory to God. And that would all be great. But Paul doesn't stop there. Paul says there's something that you need to know. He was seen by this apostle and then that apostle. He was seen by the 12. He was seen by 500. There's something about seeing Jesus that we're missing today. There's something that we've let go of here. We talk about, we preach about, we sing about the fact that he died and that God raised him from the dead. We love the fact that he's there making intercession for us, and we should, but we stop short, and I believe this is where we lack so much. I don't think Paul's saying he was seen to these 500 so that we would say, wow, we, we need to build a monument to those 500 people, don't we? We need to build, we, we're tearing down a bunch of monuments. We've got room for some new ones. We need some monuments to these people so that we can say, wow, they saw Jesus. But that's not what the Holy Spirit's saying. The Holy Spirit's saying no matter who you are, a known apostle whose name is almost synonymous with the church or somebody whose name was never mentioned in Scripture, doesn't matter who you are, you can have a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. You should expect to see him. We're living a Christian life without the king. We're living without seeing a glimpse of glory. And I believe in these last days, the Holy Spirit is saying to his church, why don't you ask me to see him? We've been praying for 20 years that Muslim people around the world would have interactions with Jesus, and it's been happening. And I'm thinking it might be about time for us to pray for Christians. Again and again, everywhere I go in Asia, I hear of stories. This one, Pastor Asher was just telling me this past week, I was with him Monday and Tuesday, and he was telling me about different people who in the middle of the night woke up terrified because they had seen Jesus Christ. He had come to them, not only in dream, but when they opened their eyes, he's standing there. And the impact, the transformed life that happens because of that. Why are we buying a lesser gospel? Pastor, you can't expect to see him. He's there and we're here. You, you shouldn't ask for that. That's not. Why did he show up to all them if he doesn't want to show up to me? Paul said, I'm the least. I persecuted the church. I was agreeing with everybody when they wanted to kill this one and kill that one. I held their coats when they stoned Stephen. I was doing everything I could. There is absolutely no reason under God's green earth, under his blue sky, on his green earth, that God should have allowed me to see the Son, the King of glory. But I saw him even though I didn't deserve it and I'm unworthy. I know what some of you were like before you got saved. I didn't see you killing anybody. And if Paul had that experience, why shouldn't we? Now, for all of you who are praying for Islamic people to have an experience with Jesus, to come to Jesus, to even see Jesus so that they'll recognize him, don't stop. But I'm going to encourage every one of you in this building, every man, every woman, every boy and every girl, I'm going to ask you to begin to pray for all of us in the church. We're not going to spread our prayers out too much here. Jesus said, Father, in John 17, I, not the world. I don't pray for the world. I pray for these. We're going to do the same thing. We're not even going to pray for people in other churches. I'm sorry, those of you watching, we're only praying for those of us at Central. We're going to be selfish about this. We're going to pray one for another. But we're going to say to the living God, we want to see Jesus. 
Give me a glimpse of his glory. Let him pass by me and, and cause my life to be turned upside down. Let me see him. Come on, church, let's pursue a glimpse of his glory. After that, verse 6, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. At one time. Glory to God. Come on, some of you have read the stories of R.W. Shambach. You've read the stories of, of um, Catherine Kuhlman in services they would have, and all of a sudden there was an appearance of Jesus Christ, and people's lives were changed because when you see him. But, Pastor, it's enough to be saved. It's enough to be spirit-filled. Come on, it's never enough. No matter what you've got, in God there's more no matter what you get from him he's got more to give no matter how much you pursue him he says come after me even more and if we're going to break with the garbage of this world if we're going to be healed from the things that have hurt us and nearly destroyed us we've got to see Jesus I've seen enough Facebook I don't know who did the study I forget I didn't bring the headline out here you can look it up It's the number one tool of child traffickers now, social media. The number one tool, social media. And Mark Zuckerberg can't buy up Hawaii fast enough. Sometimes they smack him on the hand a little bit and say, come on, straighten up, do better. I'm telling you, he's rotten to the core. Evil like we've never seen personified. Do you understand the basis of that whole thing is to create jealousy? That's all it does. Did you see the little girl the other day? She was some, some uh, what do they call them, influencers. And she did uh, a thing I'm going to do uh, up here in business class. And how, listen, I, I'm not impressed if you're in business class. Put me on an Emirates flight and let me see you up there in first class. I want to see, that's when I know you're in high cotton. That's when I know you're making big money. But she's in business class of some flight between Charlotte and Miami or something. And then somebody takes a picture of her. She was up there because, you know, you walk in right by business class. It's just right there. But then she goes back and sits in her seat in basic economy for the flight. But what she posted was, look at me in business class. Don't you wish you were me? Not really. I wish I really had a ticket for business class. That's what I wish. I don't want to be you where I have to pretend everything because I need more followers. I need you to be jealous of me. And all of this is now what we consider to be the great economy of the world. Number one tool for seducing and recruiting kids, social media. It, it just, and I know we're, we're in a, dilemma. What do we do? Because we want to share the gospel. We want to reach people. And listen, technologically, it, it, nothing works. The thing that works with the least problems is Facebook, it seems like, or at least it has the devil's anointing so that somehow you can use it. We've identified my frustration now, haven't we? Come on, let's finish out today. I'm in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. I want to see Jesus. I don't want to see him when I get to heaven. Yes, I do. I want to see him now. I, I want to see Jesus. I want to see him like John the Apostle saw him in the book of Revelation. I want to see him. Father, give us as we pray one for another. We've prayed for Muslim people around the world, men and women, to have an encounter with Jesus. And Lord, you've done that by revealing yourself, coming to them in dreams, in person. And they have been overwhelmed. They've been broken. They've, they've come running to you because they saw you. God, I now pray that for us, for our church, for Central Assembly. We want to see Jesus. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. The old way with laws etched in stone led to death, though it began with such glory that the people of Israel could not bear to look at Moses' face. For his face shone with the glory of God, even though the brightness was already fading away. Shouldn't we expect far greater glory under the new way? 
now that the Holy Spirit is giving life. If the old way which brings condemnation, let me tell you something, everything out there brings condemnation. It may not visit you in the moment. It may not tell you about it when when you're engaged in porn. It may not tell you about it when you're running with the world. It may not tell you about it when you're drunk out of your mind. But I'm telling you, the way of the world will bring you and I condemnation. It cannot bring anything else. It doesn't have anything else to bring. If the old way, which brings condemnation, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new way, which makes us right with God? In fact, that first glory was not glorious at all compared with the overwhelming glory of the new way. So if the old way, which has been replaced, was glorious, how much more glorious is the new, which remains forever? Hallelujah. Verse 12, since this new way gives us such confidence, we can be very bold. Number one, there is so much, Paul said, sexual immorality in the world. Number two, He said there's only one important thing, and that's that Jesus died. Number three, this new thing is more glorious than any other thing, but we've lost that. That's what we've lost. If we don't have something that's more glorious than any other thing, we don't have the thing. There must be something glorious about porn because it's still a thing. There must be something glorious about sexual assault rape. There must be something wonderfully glorious about adultery, fornication, homosexuality. There must be something incredibly glorious. And because we don't have the more glorious, we walk with one eye on the cross and one eye on the crowd. (laughs) The author of Hebrews, I almost said Paul, but we know it's Priscilla. She said... (laughs) <laughs> if you don't know, if you don't understand that, you'll see me later. She said that Moses had, had always was looking at, he, he had his eyes on that which is invisible. I don't know how you do that, but that's good. And you and I have to reach out and get a hold of Jesus. We have to see him because we're missing that glory. We're fine with, with denomination. We're fine with a building. We're fine with the right air conditioning settings. And we're fine with the padded pews. And we're fine with some music. And we're fine with some preaching. But God's saying, you're not fine. You're settling for something that's not better than the world. You're settling for something that's religious. You're settling for something that's formal and repetitive. But you're not experiencing what I've got for you. That which is new. That which is better is more glorious than anything else. God, help us to get a hold of that which is more glorious. It will help us when our loved ones die. It will help us when the world is falling apart. It will help us in a pandemic to not be afraid and have to put three masks on and a hazmat suit just to go to work. It will help us when things are sideways around us. What we have access to is more glorious than anything the world has. But the world looks at us and says, you've settled for what we have. Who are you? to tell us. Well, you're right. You're right. We see little bits and pieces of it when we go places where they've not had access to the gospel, and so the simple preaching of the gospel has that glorious effect. But in countries where we've been exposed to the gospel for many generations, God is calling us to something more. But like the Jews of the Old Testament Coming out of Egypt, we've struggled. When God said to them, come, come up onto the mountain, no, no way. He said to Moses, you go up and talk to him, come back, tell us what he said. But don't you want to see the glory? Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, that'd be great, but man, did, did you get a taste of what we had in Egypt? You remember the onions? and the watermelon, and remember how, how good it was to, to be in our own little community there in Goshen. And, but there's glory. It's more glorious than anything we've seen. And that's the world. It's always working to pull us down. But the King, Jesus Christ, is always working to lift us up. 
Come on, Paul closed out his communication with the Corinthian church and he said, come on, let's encourage each other. Let's encourage you and I live in an immoral world and there's nothing that can be done to stop the immorality in this world. Jesus himself said, it's impossible, but the defenses will come. You know, he had a little child there with him when he's saying that. He's got that baby there, that child, that toddler, and he said, I'm telling you, the goal of this world is to assault that one and everyone like him. He didn't say uh, about those who would, who would do this, that, or the other. He spoke directly to those that would assault a child, and he said, woe to you. Been better if you'd have never been born. We live, Sister Pam and I were saying Friday night, we live in the time of Noah and the days of Lot, just like Jesus said, there is no doubt but you and I have access to the glory. You and I have not just Jesus Christ in word, but we have him in deed. We need to pursue him. Jesus, give us an encounter. Give us a revelation. Let us see something that we've never seen before. Help us, Lord. We're, we're going by what we feel and what we see and what we hear, but we want to have an experience with that which it comes to us from the other world. We want to visit, have a visitation from the risen Savior, the reigning Lord. Give us an encounter honor with Jesus Christ, I pray. Hallelujah. I don't know what you've been through today in your life as a young person. I don't know what you've been through in the last couple of weeks. Well, some of you I do. We've been undergoing a lot of loss here. It just seems like death after death. But no matter what, we can encourage each other. Amen? We can. Come on, stand with me this morning. And we do it by reminding ourselves of who Jesus is and what he has promised to us. Yeah, there is an aspect of future. There is an aspect to all of this that is then, not now. But I'm telling you, I believe the Holy Spirit is encouraging us as modern-day believers to press through to more, to get to a place where we're seeing the Lord. Help us, Lord, help us. Would you bow your hearts for just a moment this morning? In a few moments, we're going to make it possible for you to be prayed for. No matter what you've been through, no matter what you're carrying, you may have secrets. We are not asking you to reveal those secrets at all. You may have things that have never been revealed that you don't know what would happen if you did reveal them. That's okay. That's between you and the Lord. But in a moment, the prayer team is going to be here to pray for you and to believe God for a visitation some of your healing may begin instantly but some of it may be a process some of that comes as we journey with Jesus some of it comes as we continue to put confidence in God Paul closed it all out by saying, come on, now we can come with boldness. I love that. Now we can be bold with God. Doesn't matter what you were exposed to. Doesn't matter what trauma you had to live through. You thought maybe even part of your body felt like it was good. This is one of the difficulties in counseling young people who've been sexually traumatized. They feel so guilty because their body may have responded. Listen, that's the body. But inside, if you were broken, crushed, crying out, if you were violated, you're not going to be able to reconcile those two things. But the reality is, you were hurt. All of that can never take away your boldness when you know Jesus. When you have the greatest thing, you can come to the king and say, I don't understand why you allowed this to happen to me. I don't understand why it was permitted. You're the God that can stop anything and yet you didn't stop this. But he's the God that will come alongside you and say, listen, there's still purpose in this and there's value in your life. Come boldly, come on, come boldly. Come boldly to the king of glory. Come boldly and let him heal you and help you and restore hope to you. Hallelujah. Now as I begin to pray for you, if you want to slip into this altar this morning, why don't you take a step? Come on, it might be the hardest step you've ever taken. Nobody's going to ask you to reveal anything. Nobody's going to tell you how you should feel or what you should do. We're just going to believe together. As you step into this altar, why don't you come boldly today? Father, in the mighty name of Jesus, 
We're praying today that you would encourage us as we encourage one another. We're praying today that we would have boldness. As the Bible says, no matter what's happened to us, no matter what hurt we felt. Now, Father, we also pray for physical healing. Lord, we're praying today for healing for those ladies who are in the hospital right now, for others who are afflicted in body, those who have had a diagnosis from the doctor and they're struggling, those who feel overwhelmed physically, one situation after another, one sickness after an ailment after affliction. Jesus, touch us today. Touch us, touch us. In your mighty name. This altar is open. If you need physical healing today, you come as well. If you want to stand in for somebody, you have a prayer about your business, a decision you have to make, why don't you come? There's somebody here that's going to team on my left, team on my right. They'll agree with you. It's not just about something that happened 28 years ago, but it's about what's happening right now, no matter what it is. Or if you want to pray by yourself, you can slide into the altar beyond the prayer team, or you can slide in right here at my little altar, and you can just begin to say, Lord, I want that visitation pastor was talking about. I want to see Jesus for myself. If 500 unnamed followers saw you, why can't I? And Paul said, come on, ask boldly. We can come with boldness and say, I want to see him. Glory to God. I want to see him. May the risen Savior, Jesus Christ, who shed his blood for you, be seen by you. May his favor come to you. May his healing be empower, empowered into you, instilled in you, imparted to you. May that healing cause you to triumph over hurts, assaults, and wounds. May he assign his angels to you. And may you be blessed with a mature believer in your life somebody that can speak into you and pray with you in those dark hours. May you be gloriously encouraged this week. May I be encouraged this week. May you be reminded that you are not on the journey alone. May the Lord remind you that he's holding you until the day of his appearing. That we're not looking for a day when we know how to, how to be politically perfect. We're not looking for a day when we're financially full. We're looking for a day when the King of glory is revealed. That's the only day we're looking for. May that day come quickly, amen. May God himself cause his joy to be a, a partner with you this week. In times and moments when you least expect it, may you feel the joy of the Lord because that's our strength. May his promises be real to you in spite of what you are going through. May a promise this week come to you from the pages of God's word, from a song that you're listening to, from a message you're hearing preached. May a promise of God be dropped into your soul like a chunk of gold. May you be able to hold on to it through the storm. I pray blessing on your finances. May you be financially blessed. I pray blessing on your relationships. May you be emotionally strengthened. I pray blessing on your physical body. May you walk in health today and every day. May the Lord meet your needs now and always until the King comes, whose name is Jesus Christ, Son of the living God. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. Don't forget the WMs are meeting there at 5 this afternoon. I'll see you on Wednesday at the Pavilion if I don't see you before. Have a beautiful week in the Lord.